And welcome everyone to today's California Libraries Learn webinar hosted by Info People. So our session today will cover everything you need to know about the Emergency Connectivity Fund. And our presenter is Laura Sasaki, and she is the Broadband Program Manager from the California State Library. Um, before I turn it over to Laura, just a few quick reminders. Uh, we have 60 minutes today for the presentation, and that will include time for your questions. We are recording today's session, and the recording along with the slides will be available to you after the webinar. Uh, we ask that you keep your microphone muted when you're not speaking, but please feel free to use that chat box at any time if you have a question or a comment. Uh, we'll definitely be keeping our eye on that. Okay, that's all I have, Laura. Uh, it's all welcome, and they're all yours. Good morning, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, and I hope that this covers the majority of the questions that you have. Um, I know that there are a lot of questions around the Emergency Connectivity Fund, and um, we're going to dive into that today. So for those of you who don't know me, I am the Broadband Manager and the E-Rate Coordinator for the State Library, and um, I have a pretty long background in IT um, since the beginning of my career, and also working with uh, broadband specifically and the E-Rate program, which is what the Emergency Connectivity Fund is built on. So we're gonna go ahead and just get into um, the agenda. So we're gonna do a pro program overview this morning, uh, and that's gonna be the applicant eligibility, getting started, eligible costs, um, and then program compliance, which is probably gonna hit on some of the hot topics for everybody attending today, um, applying for funding, and then we'll have an opportunity to, to go through uh, questions uh, at the end. So uh, as Mary said, we will be um, taking questions in the chat as we go through. There's a lot of content to cover, so I wanna try and get through as much of it as possible. Um, however, if there's something that is just driving you nuts about a slide that, that we covered and uh, you, you've got a question that you want to ask right then, feel free to um, put in that in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. You feel free, feel free to do that. Okay, so a little bit introduction to the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Um, it was enacted on May 10th of this year as part of the American Rescue Plan Act, and it's $7.17 billion. And it's for E-rate eligible schools and libraries to connect the student staff and library patrons that lack internet access. And this is specifically away from a campus for a school or a library. Now, though it doesn't call it out specifically in the order itself, um, library patrons do include library staff if they meet the same, if they meet the criteria for participating in the program. So funding is limited to the purchase of eligible equipment and services um, who would otherwise lack access to sufficient internet connectivity and devices. And that is for, um, completing tasks related to online learning or for uh, connectivity in the home. For example, if you have library patrons who um, don't have devices or connectivity at their home, they are eligible. So by virtue of its name, this is an emergency uh, program, meaning that it is uh, not intended to be a long-term supplemental program. It is a lot of money. There are a lot of strings attached to it. And once it is either used up, it, there isn't a plan for it to be replenished. Um, but at the same time, I think that the FCC is looking at this as a potential opportunity to fill in some significant gaps that have been in the E-rate program and that have been um, ongoing issues with the field. So um, a lot of you have, always, have asked me, hey, can we get end user equipment through um, any of these, the E-rate the e program or some of the other FCC programs? And the, the answer has always been no. This program actually does allow that. There are a lot of caveats to it, but it is an effort to try and close the homework gap as well as the gap between um, what patrons had access to at libraries prior to the pandemic and that void that may have been left uh, during the pandemic. So it's built on the E-rate program. Uh, the E-rate rules require that schools and libraries uh, use supported services primarily for educational purposes. 
and educational purposes. And this is, I'm just going to quote this directly. It's defined as activities that are integral, immediate, and proximate to the education of students. And in the case of libraries, integral, immediate, and proximate to the provision of library services to library patrons. The reason that I am going to also be uh, referring to schools in this is because in some instances, libraries may want to partner with schools and it's important to know how it impacts both schools and libraries in those instances. So eligibility, and this is specifically applicant eligibility. Um, oops, sorry, it's, it's a combination. <laughs> so it is applicant eligibility and also device eligibility. So who is eligible? Schools, libraries, and consortia of schools and libraries that are eligible for support under the E-rate program. And this includes um, anyone who is not currently participating in the E-rate program. You're still eligible to participate in the Emergency Connectivity Fund. Tribal libraries are also eligible. Um, and that's those that are uh, by statute eligible for support from the state library administrative agencies under LSTA. So what is eligible? And this is 100% reimbursement with the exception of the caps for Wi-Fi hotspots, routers, modems, devices that combine a router and modem. So if you think of um, the equipment that sometimes you receive from a service provider in your home, it, it, it integrates a modem and a wireless router into one, and then connected devices. So specifically a laptop and tablet computers. Where is it eligible? Specifically away from a school or library campus. And the timing of this for window one, this is the first window of filing and this is for new services. It's a 45 day filing window, open June 29th and it closes August 13th, uh, 2021 at 11.59 um, PM Eastern time. So it's important to remember that. We'll touch on it again a little bit later. And the expenditures that it covers are from July 1st of 2021 through June 30th of 2022. So year one is a one year program, again, reflecting the emergency nature of the funding. So the E-rate definition of the library, and again, because we're building on the E-rate program for the Emergency Connectivity Fund, the definition is as follows, a public library, a public elementary school or secondary school library, an academic library, a research library, a private library, but there are some caveats to that. And then additionally, um, library may also refer to a library consortium. And that is, uh, can be some of our cooperatives, if, if a cooperative wants to apply as a consortium with all of the libraries under it, you can apply for uh, the ECF fund that way as well. So the only libraries um, that are ineligible are those that are for profit or have endowments in, in excess of $50 million. So getting started and things that you need to have. You need to have an FCC registration number you have to have a build entity number, and we and you also have to register with SAM.gov. So your FCC re registration number, if you're already participating in the E-rate program, you have one. So you don't need to re-register or, um, or ask for another one. If you do not have one, um, there's a link, and, and these slides will be made available to you. There's a link there that you can actually go and register for uh, an FCC registration number. Um, the USAC build entity number, we call them BENS, <laughs> um, is information on um, the user, the address, the location that is receiving the bills. Um, so if you are not, again, already registered with the E-rate program, you can uh, contact USAC to uh, establish yourself with the program and um, be able to participate that way. If you already have information in the E-rate productivity portal, that's going to be imported and rolled over into the ECF portal because, of course, we have to have portals for everything. Um, registration with SAM.gov, this is so that you are able to receive the funds once the applications are approved. So there is a link to register there. Um, it can take over a week to get approved. So um, while you're 
potentially preparing your application or getting ready to um, file, I, I would suggest going ahead and um, putting in a request or, or filling out that application so that it's ready to go. Um, for eligible costs, and again, I'm going to try and get through these as quickly as possible. Um, because I want to allow time for questions, and I know that there are a lot of questions around ACF. So we're going to get into eligible costs. Broadband connections. Broadband equipment, and this is when we're talking about um, Wi-Fi hotspots, modems, routers, or the combination of, of which, um, have a cap at, of $250 per device. And that is literally for the equipment, not the service, just the equipment. Um, so some of the hotspots that we think of are typically the small ones that are, you know, I don't know, $50, $60. Um, the enterprise ones are tend to be a little bit more expensive. And um, the, the cap for that equipment is at $250. Broadband services. So there is not a minimum standard set for broadband services for up and down speeds um, for this program. So um, one Wi-Fi hotspot is allowed per user. And for fixed internet connections, in other words, internet connections that are purchased and used at the home, um, one service connection is allowed per location or per address. There aren't any price caps for broadband services, but USAC will review the cost for reasonable, reasonableness, and that was their word. Um, so reasonableness has not been defined by the FCC, aside from the caps. So, um, that is one where you kind of have to use best judgment and be able to maybe support or document why you chose what you chose. Um, during the program integrity assurance process, which is where they contact you and ask questions about your application, they may just ask, how did you come up with uh, the, the number uh, and the cost for your broadband services? So, um, Limited support for off-campus network. This has been a really big one because um, a lot of a lot of uh, potential applicants have asked whether or not they can build out their own networks. And the the rule generally is no. They do allow for one exception, and that is for um, where there is no commercially available internet access and. That means, and I will cover this a little bit more later, but what that means is if you can get a Comcast connection or a Crown Castle or a Spectrum or whatever it happens to be, if that's available in your area, uh, you would have to be able to prove that it is not available at that subsection of homes that you want to build out a network to support. So um, there, is, there is an exception that allows that, but it is very limited. So connected learning devices, these are specifically laptop and tablets. Uh, PCs and smartphones are not, and when I say PCs, sorry, desktop computers are not um, eligible under this program. So the commission will provide reimbursement up to $400 for laptops and tablets. Um, smartphones will not be approved even there was a little bit of an argument because some smartphones have the capability of sort of being turned into a, a laptop or a smarter device, um, but those are not eligible. So an applicant can purchase something that's more expensive. I know that we've heard from the field that $400 really isn't going to go very far. Um, you can purchase a device that is in excess of that $400. We'll just be responsible for the balance out of pocket. There is also an allowance for both um, uh, services and devices that um, may be more expensive because they are serving a population with disabilities and it needs to be a device that's very specific for that. So you can actually request a waiver from the FCC um, to increase the cap in those instances. So self-provision networks, this is what we talked about just a little bit. So those are the networks that either you build out, you build out with a partner. Um, it can be um, a fiber network. It can be um, a white space network. It can be an LTE network. So the only time that those are eligible under this program are in the limited instances where applicants 
can demonstrate that there is no commercially available options in the, in the area in which uh, the intended um, uh, patrons reside. So eligible costs when you do meet those criteria um, include the special construction, the activation and installation, um, the equipment um, that is needed to do that, and then any uh, end user equipment that is also necessary to receive that signal. There's a very heavy burden of proof on the applicant anytime that you want to build out a self-provision network. One of the biggest barriers to that is getting service providers to actually say and put in writing that they cannot provide service to the location that you need service at. Um, we've heard from the field that they are unwilling to do this in many instances. Um, and, and it's understandable because if you say that you have coverage in an area and then you don't, um, it's not a great, it's not a great look. So um, that's, a, that's been a challenge for some of the applicants who potentially wanted to build out self-provision networks. The other challenge is that you have to be able to demonstrate that the network will be completely built out um, and functional and providing service within a year from receiving the funding commitment decision letter. And that can be a pretty heavy lift um, because as some of you know, building out those types of networks takes time, money, permitting, and there's a lot, of, a lot that goes along with that. So ineligible costs, what is ineligible? Um, equipment, so full one-to-one -one device um, equipment rollout where there is no unmet need, um, desktop computers, smartphones, and peripherals, um, accessories beyond a power cord. <laughs> so um, replacement of lost, stolen, or damaged devices. Um, and just a side note to that, if a device is lost, stolen, or damaged, the only requirements of um, the program are that you document that in your asset tracking, simply that the, the device was lost, it was stolen, it was damaged, whatever it happens to be. Um, electronics to light dark fiber. Under services, full one-to-one -one internet, in other words, per patron, um, where no unmet need exists. Uh, device and network monitoring and management, administrative costs, private networks, and this is what we were just talking about, cybersecurity and filtering, and then dark fiber. The only instances where the dark fiber or the electronics may be eligible would, again, be in that very limited instance where um, there is no commercially available internet. Unbundled costs of software and user licenses, firewalls, and warranties and maintenance. If it is bundled in, it is eligible. If it is not bundled with the service or device, it is considered ineligible. Okay, program compliance. This is going to be a lot of text, guys, so I will try and get through this as quickly as possible, but also to make sure that we've covered any um, uh, really, really critical points. So competitive bidding. Um, typically with the E-rate program, those of you who do participate in it are aware that there are very specific competitive bidding requirements. There are not the same competitive, or bid, bid, excuse me, competitive bidding requirements for ECF. They do require that you adhere to state, local, and any federal procurement requirements that apply to your particular um, library, whether it's city requirements, county requirements, state requirements. Um, you will be certifying when you um, file the application that you did uh, comply with all of those procurement requirements. And that is um, with respect to both new purchases of equipment and services, or previous purchases of equipment and services for the time frame that the window opens for reimbursements. And that's something that has not even been announced yet. Um, so this also means that if you are exempt from following any of your uh, particular local uh, procurement requirements, that that be documented. And um, if, Applicants, this is a very interesting side note. So if applicants are unwilling or unable to certify that they have complied with all state local uh, procurement rules, they will not be able to receive support from the ECF program. 
So du duplicative services, so no double dipping. Um, so for example, if a patron's household is receiving support from the emergency broadband benefit, which is the, um, the low cost uh, broadband service to the home. It's another FCC program that we talked about probably a month or so ago. Um, if they're already receiving support from that, then they wouldn't be eligible to receive um, broadband connectivity under the ECF program. However, if that money was starting to run out, the library could then seek funding to, to keep uh, the connectivity going if the end result is that the, the patron would not have sufficient access. Uh, this also applies to any uh, previous federal funding or state funding that was related to the emergency, uh, the COVID emergency and the, and the pandemic. If there was already money uh, paying for some of the equipment and some of the, the services, then there's no double dipping there. It's already considered um, paid for. So unmet need. The reason that there is this block of text is because I really wanted you guys to just have it. Um, this is specifically from the order. And this is, to be frank, um, the requirement that has caused the most um, the most issues <laughs> with the program and libraries. Um, whoops, sorry. Let me go back to that. So this is. The, the statement of need. So specifically, the biggest cornerstone of this program is that it is of an emergency nature and it is to quickly meet unmet need, meaning that um, students, staff, library patrons who do not have access to connectivity and devices be connected as quickly as possible. Part of that is the requirement, and again, they did use the word require because this is in the actual report and order, that the library patron sign and return a statement that they would otherwise lack the access, equipment or services sufficient to meet the, their educational needs, if not for what was being provided by the library. So I think this is one that, that we will probably talk about in the discussion uh, at the end. What we sent to the FCC and we have an open line with the FCC right now because they're very interested in hearing what's going on in California and we're in, interested in hearing what libraries have to say. So I'm gonna take a moment and just say to all of you, please continue to send me your questions, the challenges that this poses to you because the more that I hear that, the more that I have documentation of that, the more I'm able to say, okay, see, look, this is what, we, what we're facing in the field and what we need to work with you on. So uh, we sent over to them the two government codes that uh, talk about library records, patron data, and privacy. We also sent over um, the executive order, and it's from the Brown administration from uh, 2276 that talks about the privacy as well. And then um, we asked that the FCC take a look at those laws and statutes and come back to us and let us know what their opinion was on how it affected and impacted the requirement to collect that data. So the response from the FCC is below. Um, basically, they're suggesting that there be written consent or um, consent required from a patron to be able to release that data. Um, I don't think that that comes close to where the majority of you have expressed you're comfortable with collecting data and retaining data. Um, so again, I want to hear from you so that I'm able to pass that information along because if we don't talk about it and we don't raise the issue, it doesn't go any further. So this is, this is where we are as of Monday. This was a response that we got on Monday. Um, SIPA compliance. So this is directly again from the order. And this is the one instance that they have really, really talked about SIPA compliance in a way that they never have, even through the ERA program. There's been so many questions about where it applies, where it doesn't apply. So I thought that this was very helpful. SIPA applies to a school or library 
having computers and requires the entity to certify compliance as to, as to its computers. Both words indicate that SIPA is triggered by ownership of a device, not the location where the device is used or temporarily possessed. Um, and I thought that was a very succinct way to kind of encapsulate some of the challenges we've had identifying where and what needs to be filtered. So I included it in here. And then um, to get a little bit more in the, the weeds on that, um, SIPA applies on school or library owned computers. And this is if a school or library accepts emergency connectivity fund or E-rate support for internet access, internet services, or internal connections. So that would be um, internet access under category one, internal connections under category two. So SIPA, and, and actually I'm gonna stop for a second because um, when we're talking about support for internet access and internet services, those are specific methods of filing for connectivity through E-rate. If you are a library that currently participates um, in the connection to CalREN and Scenic, um, the filing for that is a little bit different. We file for telecommunication services, not internet access. So it changes how it applies to you. Um, as long as you are not purchasing fixed broadband to a home and you are purchasing hotspots or laptops, those do not need to be filtered if, you are, if you're connecting that way. If you are filing for E-rate on your own and you are requesting internet access, you already have to be filtered. And so the SIPA, the SIPA requirements would apply to, to you and those devices. SIPA does not apply um, on either school or library owned computers if you're not accepting funds from ECF, E-rate in those categories that we already talked about. It also does not apply to third party owned devices. So if somebody owns a connection at home, but they get a hot spot from you, that doesn't apply to that device. So I hope that that clears it up a little bit. This has been um, an issue that we've, we've long debated. Okay, so this is another fun one. And sorry guys, I do have to be the bearer of bad news sometimes when it comes to things like this. Um, again, because it is built on the E-rate program, they've taken a lot of the rules of the E-rate program and filtered them down into the emergency connectivity fund. One of those is tenure document retention. And this is tenure document retention after the last date of service. So in the E-rate world, I'll give you an example. Most of you enter into a multi-year contract for internet connectivity. Usually it's a five-year contract. So if you, um, if you are in, in that five-year contract, you usually have a year before that that is um, doing procurement, RFPs, whatever it happens to be. So anything connected to that procurement is required, plus the five years, plus the 10 years that you have to hang on to that in case you're audited. So that is normal for the E-rate program. It's something that um, schools are used to doing because they've participated since the first year. Um, libraries, again, if you connect through CalREN and Scenic, all of that is handled for you. So it's not data that you typically are seen or responsible for collecting because you are not the, the applicant. Scenic is the applicant on your behalf. So um, I know that we have people on this call that are connected to Scenic and we have libraries that are not connected to Scenic. So I wanna differentiate between how that those rules apply. So for broadband service, the type of uh, information that you have to keep on record is the type of service, upload download speeds, monthly caps, um, who is receiving that service? I know that this is going to be a hot, a hot topic right here. Um, the service address and the dates the services were received. So that is for the, the fixed broadband specifically. So anything that is going to a specific residence. For equipment, the device type, make and model, serial number. Those are pretty standard um, asset tracking uh, data points. Uh, the person who's receiving the device, the dates the device was loaned out, and returned. And again, this follows the E-rate document retention requirements. So applying for funds. So before you begin, things that I want you to, to think about, um, or if you're in the process of applying, continue to think about, um, develop the strategy for assessing what the unmet need is. In other words, how are you going to decide how many devices you need to get 
um, who they're going to be going out to uh, and, and how you're planning to uh, account for that. Develop a plan to distribute and track the services so that you're in compliance with the rules and identify a plan B for funding support. So in the event that, because this is a, a, this is a reimbursement program. So in the event that um, unmet need can't be verified or there are delays in funding, make sure that if you're moving forward with this, that you have an alternative funding mechanism in place. Uh, prepare and plan the process for re submitting reimbursements. And this is especially important because anything that is purchased before you actually uh, receive your funding commitment decision letter, as soon as you get that, there's a 60 day clock for reimbursement that starts and it starts right then. So it's a pretty accelerated timeline and window. So it's something that you'll want to be ready to, um, to move quickly on. So reminders, uh, we talked about this at the beginning, you're gonna want your FCC registration number, you're going to want um, your ECF portal account. Uh, if you don't have that, you can follow, um, I thought I included a link in here and I did not. So I will make that available to you guys following up on this. But um, there's, a, there's an area that you can actually go and create your, your uh, portal account if you don't already have one. Um, you'll want to know what services you're, quest, you're requesting and then all of the items that are below that and bulleted out and then any vendor information. So if the person or the vendor and company that you're working with already participate in the E-rate program, they'll have what's called a service provider and identification number. And again, that'll be rolled into the emergency connectivity fund portal. But if they don't, they can still participate um, and you'll just have to list out that information in the portal. Um, so just a reminder that you do need to certify your form 471 no later than August 13th, 2021 by 11.59 p.m. Eastern time, which again, we're Pacific time. So um, I had a year filing E-rate that I kind of lost track of that and was very, very close to the deadline. Um, so if you certify your form after this date and time, it'll be considered out of window. And when it's considered out of window, that means that you would have to actually be granted a waiver request by the FCC in order for USAC to review the application. So it's very important that you uh, are able to certify by that time and that date. So when you're getting started filing the fourth form 471, um, I would highly suggest, and the links are right here, that you go and look at um, the it's 15 minutes, the, the module on filing the form 471. I think it will be very helpful. I'm not able to share screenshots here because as a state E-rate coordinator, when I log in, I have a very, very different view. Um, and I don't, I don't see an applicant view. I see more of an overview. So I've included the link right there, um, as well as there's a link. The second one that is included takes you directly to um, USAC's page that walks you through all of the steps for filing on of the, for the 471 things that you'll need to have, uh, the data points that you'll be inputting, and it has all of that information there. So once you've filed, if you figure out, oh shoot, I made an error, I need to go back and correct it. Um, you do have the opportunity to do so. Um, you can, there's a contact reviewer button in the portal and you click on that, you explain to the reviewer what happened. Um, if it is an error that, you know, dollars are off or you transpose something, just provide the documentation that shows, you know, kind of where, where um, you may have transposed numbers. Um, and then you'll be notified on the funding commitment decision letter if the correction was allowable. And typically um, reviewers are good about talking you through it too. And um, you, can, you can ask them before you get the funding commitment decision letter if that was allowable. But that's where you'll find out um, the final word of whether or not it was. So approvals, once you receive the um, funding commitment decision letter that will be sent to both the applicant and the service provider um, in the portal. And if, again, if you have questions about it, you can um, contact the, it's the customer service portal, but what that does is it creates a, a ticket within the system. And then that is routed to a reviewer or somebody that you can contact and ask for questions uh, or ask questions about the, the comments or any reductions on your funding commitment decision letter. Um, the reimbursement process and timeline, 
The FCC has um, application approvals of 50% by September 12th and 70% by November 21st. So again, we talked about that 60 day window to submit um, and request reimbursement. So hopefully we'll be doing that. Um, there'll be a lot of those requests going in for reimbursement after that September 12th date and even more um, after November. So in that time frame, there should be a lot. Um, applicants and service providers can submit requests for reimbursement. Um, funds may be also sent directly to the service provider as long as the applicant is okay with it. Um, and in this program, consultants and service providers can actually help with the preparation of reimbursement, but if there are any fees associated with that, those are not eligible for reimbursement. Uh, applicants who have contracts or binding agreements uh, before you've, sorry, um, with, with service providers can request reimbursement before you've paid for it. In other words, you're waiting to find out whether or not you got the, the funds before you move forward with that. Um, and then once funds are received, you as the applicant, you have 30 days to certify compliance and provide um, verification that you've paid the service provider. So that's, that's to get your, your order processed and um, get the, the ball rolling with either the services or the goods. Um, so submission of re reimbursement requests, participants, meaning applicants and you, will also be cer certifying that you're asking for funding only for eligible equipment and services. And you will be required to certify when you submit re reimbursement requests that you're maintaining an inventory of the services, the assets, and then the data regarding fixed broadband. And those are the, the data points that we talked about earlier. You will also be required to certify that you'll re retain all program records for 10 years following the last date of service, as well um, as agreement, agreement to participate in audits. And that's just, that is a standard requirement of the FCC and USAC programs is, um, to prevent and guard against waste, fraud, and abuse. They do conduct um, audits. I've been through one as an applicant. And as long as you've done everything by the book, there's nothing to worry about, but you know, it is a little bit intimidating. Service providers are not required to submit invoices, um, but they can if they're willing to do that and they're willing to work with you at the library. Um, applicants and service providers must submit um, uh, invoices detailing the items purchased. Again, waste, fraud, and abuse. So if you think about it in terms of verifying that you got what you said you were going to get, you um, distributed it to who you said you were going to, it kind of goes along with that. Reim uh, applicants can submit reimbursement requests and invoices within first 15 days of the first funding wave um, and up to 16 to 60 days from the funding commitment decision letter. If you have a revised one that comes in, Again, if you have to appeal something, you'll have a later date on your funding commitment decision letter or the service delivery date, whichever is later of all of those. So audits. Um, this is important because it ties back to the patron data and privacy. Um, so the audit requir the re requirements are still being developed, but it may include audits by the Office of Inspector General. Um, the commission staff is directed to work with auditors to accept, to accept the anonymized information, and that's the PII that we've been talking about. Um, but if it is insufficient, um, auditors can actually request that consent be obtained to release that PII. It's a request. Selling, reselling, or transferring equipment funded through the program is not allowed for at least three years after purchase. So um, again, that follows the same E-rate rules and requirements for equipment, that it needs to be um, in use for at least three years before it is um, sold, moved to a different location, or disposed of. Okay, I know that was a lot. <laughs> Um, and I wanted to get through it so that we had plenty of time for questions and for discussion. So um, Mary, if you've got some questions there in the chat and if folks want to start putting questions in the chat, this is the time for discussion. You had one question come in. Uh, should we still apply while waiting 
final word from the FCC about needed patron information. Privacy is indeed a big concern and people won't be willing to share. This strongly implies to underserved populations. So it's a tough, it's a tough one to answer. Um, it's a 45 day window, part of which has already passed, right? So I do not foresee that we will have a response from the FCC that mitigates all of those concerns before the end of the 45 days. We will continue to work with them um, and hopefully be able to find some resolution in some middle ground. Um, I'm hoping to uh, potentially call on some of you to help me with that. Um, but I will say, if you don't ask, you don't get. So if you're comfortable submitting an application, that application can be canceled. So um, if you get to a point where you feel like, okay, we're not making the progress that I want, um, you can actually cancel that application. It will not count against you. You will not be responsible for it. Um, and that's, that's most useful if you're waiting to purchase equipment and services, right? Um, if you already have purchased equipment and services um, and are, are planning the application, I would say just move forward as, as you've intended, but be aware that there may not be a lot more flexibility in the short term, but that we will continue to work on trying to get that resolved. I hope that that helps a little bit. Um, I can't give you the, the perfect answer right now. Um, okay. Do the service do the services have to be newly begun, or can it can it be to help fund hotspots already in place? So you can it can be to fund hotspots that are already in place. However, the the time frame that you can that you can apply for is specifically costs from July one of twenty twenty one through and cost through um, six thirty. Uh, 2022. So if you are in, if you are in the middle of a three year agreement, for example, you can apply for that one year of it. Does that answer it? Uh, someone else is asking. I'm still confused about whether service charges for hotspots are covered, and how and whether there are maximum dollar limits. Okay, so um, there are not. I'm going to put this over here, so I'm also seeing the question. Um, so service charges mean if. Uh, Alicia, if you mean monthly recurring, uh, yes, those are eligible. There is no cap on that. Um, it just has to be reasonable. Uh, the cap is on the device itself. So your hotspot device equipment is capped at 250. They are not, um, they are not capping or providing a cap for uh, the, the service amount. And additionally, I didn't mention this, um, there is not a cap on the amount, the total amount you can request. There is, there is no cap on that at this point in time. So your application can, can um, encompass quite a, quite a lot of requests. Do sites which obtain E-rate through Scenic need to establish their own FCC number and BEN or can Scenic provide those numbers to, to the applying organization? So if you already, um, receive services through Scenic, you also will have an account in Epic because you have to, um, I think you do, hang on. <laughs> um, so the short answer to that is, you no, know, you do not have to establish your own FCC number and, and build entity number. And yes, we can get that information for you. I'll make it, I'll make it easy. So um, I would uh, come to me with that request and I can get it for you. Are other state libraries responding in a similar fashion to the FCC as ours? Um, in the sense that there are objections, yes. Um, in the sense that they are working directly with this FCC, I don't know. Um, I, I can ask, but I, I don't know if, if they are. I do know that ALA is working very, very closely with the FCC, has, um, uh, at the, on the last slide, in fact, I'll just hop to it really quick here. On the last slide right here, we have um, just the link to our ECF page. Um, on there, there is also a link to a, a fairly strongly worded um, letter that ALA sent to the FCC on June 28th, I believe. So that might be of interest to you as well. 
can the patron self attestation be a survey response? Curtis, can you unmute yourself and explain what you are thinking a little bit more on the on the survey response, what kind of survey it would be? Yeah, well, I'm really just trying to figure out how to get around maintaining extra documentation for 10 plus years. Um, and also just to try to make the process as smooth as, as possible for, you know, patrons checking out hotspots. So, um, it, it's always fun when you have new programs that, that are through USAC and the FCC because um, they, they do decline to, to elaborate a lot because they don't, they purposely don't want to step on um, individual states, rules, regulations, whatnot, right? So they leave a lot up to, to local control. And this is one of those things where they have not said, this is what it needs to look like. They're, they're deferring to local control on what, <laughs> what the uh, statement of need looks like. So given the fact that one of the data requirements is the person's name, and if it's a fixed one, their address, I wouldn't expect that to be on the... Um, on the, the statement of unmet need, maybe, I mean, their name probably, but um, that would have to be accounted for somehow in um, the asset tracking. So I guess a lot, I, I guess it's not super helpful, but it is left up to you um, to determine what method that you want to take as long as it meets the criteria of the data that you're required to gather. Just to follow up with that, so is the signature, I guess, a really, is that, that's mandatory, having a signature? It is. It, it says specifically in the rules, and that's why I put that, you know, big, massive chunk of text up on the, on the screen. It's paragraph 82 in the report and order um, that says that it, that it is required to have them sign a statement of need. It isn't telling us what that needs to say. Um, and there have certainly been some really, really good conversations I've had around why that's a bad idea and, and how it may really um, limit or exclude the, the patrons and people that we're trying most to serve in our communities. So um, again, that's something that I will be taking back to the FCC. This is not a done conversation, but I, I, I recognize your concern. Can the funds be used to upgrade the internet speed that is currently coming into the library? Um, at this at this time, no, because what this is intended for is for um, connectivity away from the library or the school. So um, that's something that you would want to just do through the normal course of probably the, your participation in the E-rate program. Okay, and Francisco, you can go ahead and unmute. He wants to ask his question. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. So we were just thinking the easiest way would be to get hotspots, additional hotspots. We currently have them. But then we would have to then just have a waiver that would the patron have to sign every time they took these specific hotspots that we bought through ECF that said, you know, just don't have the funds and I need this. And that, in, this, in essence, that's the program, right? Like we would have to say, these are just, uh, these hotspots over here are just for people who, normally can't pay their uh, Wi-Fi bill or, you know, they need that for the educational purpose. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I, if you, I think if you want to frame it more around um, insufficient access rather mm -hmm. than, you know, uh, a, a socioeconomic indicator, right? Um, so, so definitely the idea is that it's to meet, again, it's, it, it's just reiterated over and over, unmet need. Um, so if you're looking at it from that standpoint, that's the easiest way to identify what you're doing there. Oh, that's great because we have areas of the county that are in the mountains that have very, very poor, uh, there's technically no service in some of these areas. And so we would so, find a vendor that had better service, you know. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and, and it's interesting because um, I was on a very brief uh press thing with the the chairwoman 
uh, earlier this week. And what she did say regarding specifically, not, not what you're talking about with the hotspots, but the, the, the request that a lot of people have had about building out their own networks is that, you know, she does expect to see that in California because we have such rural areas that simply don't have the coverage or they don't have commercially available um, internet access. So um, you're on the right track looking at areas that may not have traditional coverage and what the options are to be able to provide coverage at the home for those those patrons. So thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, so to clarify regarding SIPA, do we have to have filters on all library devices or just the devices reimbursed with the ECF funds? Lindsay, thank you for asking this question because I wanted to address it because I know you sent it to me earlier. Um, so it, it really depends on how your library currently applies for E-rate funds. And we cover that a little bit. Um, so, the, so if the library is currently applying for um, internet access, internet services, or uh, internal connections, and that's equipment. If you're currently applying for that, all of your devices have to be filtered, including what's coming through ECF. If you are not, and you are applying only for telecommunication services, and um, I'm looking at your, at your uh, question, um, and if you're only applying for, uh, for example, uh, laptops or tablets, or you're only applying for hotspots, those do not need to be filtered. If you're not applying for internet services and internet access through the E-rate program. So it's a weird kind of trickle down effect. Um, and Lindsay, I do wanna make sure that that's addressed your question. Well, I'm uh, sorry, I actually have a clarifying question then. Um, sure. Is that including the monthly fee for, or the monthly service for the hotspots? Or laptops? Uh, is what including it? If it's, uh, let me phrase that. If we do not have, if we're not applying through E-rate and we don't currently have filters on our items for the ECF items that we get, the laptops or the hotspots, is that just for the items themselves or is that including also the monthly service? Oh, it also includes monthly service. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, uh, so we would be required to collect and store patron data, including when they return the device and keep it for 10 years, but we may not be required to actually provide that data and could instead provide anonymized data. Is that correct? Our system does not retain this information and it would be challenging to record. So it is, it is mostly correct. So the, the, the interesting caveat to that is just the language in the, in the order that says like that there is the potential in the event of an audit. And again, I, audits, I, I don't want you to thinking that audits are just like, oh my goodness, we're all gonna get audited. They, they really are um, pretty random within, within the program. Um, so just, to, just keep that in mind. But there is that, that um, allowance in there that if the auditors are not able to verify uh, that it was that the funds were used for the appropriate um, services and end users, that they can potentially ask for that PII. Um, if you were not able to provide some kind of data in support of that, there is always the chance that you could be asked to repay funds. That is kind of the nature of what happens during those audits. So um, USAC has said that it does not have to be, in other words, you were talking about your system. It doesn't have to be recorded in the same system as your ILS um, or your, um, your asset tracking, however you need to record that data is up to you. Um, it can be anonymized, it can be de-identified, um, but it's just really odd that they've included the language that there may be still a request for PII. Um, I think we could potentially, um, in that instance, lean on the California statute that specifically um, protects patron data but that's something that we would uh, definitely need to uh, seek further opinion on. Would library card number be sufficient for records keeping? Um, 
that in and of itself, no, because again, there's a list of, of required data that, and it's on one of the slides, that you do need to retain for the fixed broadband, uh, the, the Wi-Fi hotspots and equipment. Is there a monetary cap on building out a network to a community unserved by internet providers? As a corollary question, does satellite internet count as an available provider for the attestation that a community is unserved? Um, so part one, no, there is not a monetary cap. Um, and part two, yes. Um, as long as long as they can or have provided service to that area, what you would need to do in order to be able to build out a network is go to that particular provider that you that you know has provided uh, connectivity in the past or at least advertises that they can and say, okay, we need connectivity in these areas. Can you provide it? If they cannot, try and get that in writing and document that or document your conversation. Um, and that can go towards um, supporting being able to build out your own network. I think that's where your question was going. And if not, feel free to correct me. Privacy of our patrons is our number one concern preventing our library system applying. Uh, has the state library defined the requirement for the statement? No, we have not. And I think you're, uh, Raphael, I think you're uh, referring to this, the patron statement of need. Um, we have not, uh, it's, it's been, we've discussed it um, just, just briefly, um, but as of right now, we have, we, we're not providing anything simply because there are varying opinions and there are varying level, levels of where people are comfortable or not comfortable. Um, it's kind of a, a little bit of a spectrum. And uh, I think it would be better to seek information and feedback from the field than to, um, you know, necessarily do something that's prescriptive at this point. So um, I can, I can tell you that we will probably be uh, seeking some uh, feedback from the field on that. Would patrons need to sign every time or just the first time they borrow the equipment? Um, so this goes back to a question that was asked and it's posted on the website, which was, um, you know, can we, can we do long-term loans? Um, can we do it permanently? Uh, the answer is you can do it permanently, but you can do long-term loans. So um, that might kind of help, Mike, with, with some of that is just, you know, you don't have to justify the length of your loan or anything like that, but you do have to be able to kind of, you know, track, track the equipment. Um, so the answer is yes, but you can mitigate some of that by having a very long-term loan period, but you just wanna make sure that you are periodically verifying that there is still need there. Um, and then if for some reason they're able to uh, get connection through another program or they're able to then afford it or something like that, then you're able to put that back in circulation to somebody who does um, still need the, the support. Are there any existing hotspot borrowing agreements between patron and library that we can use as a reference or a resource? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, gonna have to look into that. I don't have an answer, but I do know that we have uh, libraries that are doing it. Um, so let me look into that. And Joy, if you wanna unmute, um, she's asking for a repeat about some SIPA information. Hello, I, I kind of got lost a little bit when you were talking about the SIPA filter in regards to the question around do all of your devices have to be on SIPA and how does that affect the devices being loaned, for instance, hotspots. So I don't think it applies because it's a hotspot, is that correct? So, um, Correct. If, but it, again, it depends on, on how your, your library, if you're participating in E-rate, it depends on how your library is applying for that. Um, but for the most part, you, if you're, if you're just doing, if you're just doing laptops or tablets, and if you're just doing hotspots, you don't need to filter. If you're doing um, the broadband to the home, which some libraries wanted to do, that's something that you do have to, to filter. Does that, does that clarify? Yeah, thank you. 
You're welcome. Um, okay, so Christopher had a statement and then Mila had a, the last question, but I think Mila, I think we answered that, correct? She was asking if it has to be signed every time or just one time. Yes, okay. Okay, I think we got to all the questions, Laura. Great, uh, thank you guys for hanging in there with this. This is a, a very long, dense presentation, not the most thrilling, I admit, um, but thank you for, for hanging in there with it. Thank you for your questions. Um, I will be taking a look at those later and following up on any that we weren't able to answer and, and also just following up on uh, any comments that, that you have specifically around the patron data. So as I said, please send me um, concerns, send me suggestions, things that you've thought of. Um, encourage your, your counterparts at other libraries who may not have been here today to do the same. Um, because again, the more information I have, the better I am uh, able to speak to how you feel about this and what your, what your concerns, suggestions, um, reservations are. So thank you so much for that.